All right, so let's get on to note 19 from CS70. This one is about the geometric distribution and the Poisson ge distribution. Um, first off, we're going to start with geometric. So let's let some random variable x represent the number of tosses of a biased coin before we arrive on heads. Okay, and um, if we let the probability that we land on heads be p, then um, 1 minus p is going to be the probability that we land on tails, and if it takes i trials for us to land on heads first, then this is the probability that you know it takes i trials, because this says that, oh, if it takes us four trials before we hit heads, then we have to flip three tails. So that's the probability of flipping three tails. Right. So just to define it, some random variable x is said to have a geometric distribution with parameter p. Um, that's just how you would say it, pretty much. And it takes this form. This should look fairly familiar. This is the um, what is it, probability mass function for this distribution. And this just proves that the probabilities add up to 1. Um, if we sum from 1 to infinity these probabilities, p comes out. And then as this goes to infinity, we can use the um, geometric series formula to put this into this form. And I mean, algebraically, we can see p over p is equal to 1. OK, so now we're going to talk about the mean of a geometric random variable. So just applying the definition of expectation, um, we're going to get the sum of each i times that probability that the random variable takes on that i. And um, if we sort of just sub in what this equation was from up here, then this is what we get. And um, let's see, this is just sort of what the geometric, geometric distribution looks like. OK, and I think they introduced another formula too. I'm not really sure what the usefulness of it is. I, maybe it's just for looking at it from a different point of view. Um, right, so I guess the expectation is you know, the same as like fixing some i and then getting the probabilities that our random variable is greater than or equal to that i. So um, we can do this algebraically. So let's say we fix our i to be 0. Um, we would multiply that by 0. You know, if we were just taking the, the expectation that our random variable is set to 0, that's going to be you know, some fix. That's going to be like an event. right? And then if we say that it's equal to 1, then we're going to multiply 1 by the probability that our random variable is set to 1, and 2 times the probability that our random variable is set to 2. And then if we expand this out, we're going to get this form right here. And um, that makes sense. You know, there's 0 p0s, there's 1 p1, there's 2 p2s, 3 p3s. And then we can sort of group these into these sequences. So we can have one sequence that has every p starting at p1 in it, so, you know, p1, p2, p3, p4. Um, but we only have, you know, one p1. So now for the next sequence, we'll have to start at p2. And then every other sequence has at least two terms in it. So we can put everything into there. And then as we see, the, these sums of probabilities are the same as saying that the probability is greater than or equal to you know, the values that we're starting on. And this says the exact same thing. It just puts it into a mathematical notation. So um, yeah, the expected value, as we sort of stated up here, um, we're just going to define it as some index j to infinity, where j is some value that the random variable can take on. And then we're multiplying that by the probability that the random variable takes that value. And um, from here, what we are going to do is, again, keep the j. And we're going to sum up. We're basically going to expand out what this is, right? Um, if j is equal to 1, then there's just this one term right here. If j is equal to 2, then we sum up um, probability 2, probability 2. You know, we do it twice. And if j is equal to 3, we would do it three times. And then we're taking the sum of all of those sums 
of these same terms. Hopefully that makes sense. And then we're just taking that second line, converting it to the third line by looking at it slightly differently. So in this case, we're going to set, um, you know, I can be initialized to one and then J is just going to sit at where I is and then it's going to iterate to infinity and just sum up all the probabilities. And then I is going to increment to two and then we're going to go from two up to infinity and get, you know, that sum. And so this is what, that's how that third equation works. And then the last one is just essentially taking what we have right here and putting in some summation notation. Okay, so honestly, yeah, a lot of this note emphasizes the mathematical, um, I guess, understanding, like proofs of how this works. But to me, I wasn't really left with a good understanding of how to apply these. There was like one or two examples per um, distribution, but I feel like I didn't really get like a solid way of like knowing how to use these from this note. Uh, but anyways, let's continue on to what's the, what is this? The expectation is. So again, we have the probability mass function, um, which, or sorry, so this is not the probability mass function. This is simply um, just the probability that our, um, what is it? That all coins before I must be tails, right? So if we just apply the expectation to this, um, what do we get? Yeah, that's pretty much what we have there. It's one over P. Um, let me see. Give me one second. Oh, so sorry, sorry, yeah, so basically we're taking what we had just proven. This is why we use the tail sum formula. We take this and show um, what the expectation is. And first off, we're saying that this right hand side is equal to this. And you know what does that mean? Well, I believe we already said it, but the probability that we need greater than or equal to a certain number of tosses before we get heads means that everything before that must not have been heads. So we need to, you know, multiply the probability of receiving tails times the number of times it took before we got our head. Right, and so that's what this is. And because the expectation is equal to the sum of you know, the probability that x is greater than or equal to i, then we can just plug it in and using the geometric infinite geometric series formula, um, we obtain this, which comes out to be one over p. Okay, so yep, that is what our expectation is. So let's see, if coin has a half chance of landing on heads, then we expect to flip it two times to get heads. Yeah, I feel like we've seen this before. Again, if a coin has a 0 0.1 chance of landing on heads, then it'll take 10 times, or we will expect it to take 10 times before we actually land on heads. Okay, probably, I believe this is straight from some other note. But anyways, we're gonna move on to the variance of a geometric random variable. And so we're going to define for a random variable x with the expectation e of x is equal to mu. We're gonna say that the, the variance of it is equal to this expression. The expectation of x minus mu squared. So this is just kind of refreshing ourselves on you know what variance is. And um, let's see. We typically use another formula for variance when proving other proofs essentially, which states that the variance is equal to, um, what is it? expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x quantity squared. 
Um, but do we use that here? I guess, well, yeah. So that, that's pretty much what we do. So this is what, th that's the formula we use to prove this variance. And we're going to take this and kind of expand it out actually into this form. So this x squared is gonna become x times x minus one, or wait, hold on. That's not completely accurate. This expression right here is going to become the sum of these parts right here. So if we think about it, we have an, if we multiply this out, we have an e of x squared minus e of x. And if we take that minus e of x, add it to this e of x, then those terms cancel. And then we're left with an e of x squared minus e of x squared or e of x quantity squared. So just, if that wasn't helpful, just try to see how this becomes this. If you just, ex um, if you basically just multiply this inner term out and then apply the linearity of expectation to these internal terms. And then you just manipulate this to look like that. But the reason why we put this into this form is because assuming we know this, then it makes our lives you know, significantly easier. So first off, assuming that the expectation of x times x minus one is equal to this expression right here, we can simply sub in these terms and um, just doing a little bit of manipulation, we get this. So that is what our variance is. But before we move on, we should probably prove to ourselves that this does in fact equal two times one minus p over p squared. And so we're going to derive that really quick. So let's see, infinite geometric series identity, um, you know, using this formula from before, which did we use it for the tail sum? Uh, I guess it was down here. So this, so our, our starting term is, is one, our ratio is um, one minus p. So one minus one minus p yields just this, you know, one over p. Okay, now we're gonna differentiate with respect to p. So, um, you know, it's basically minus p raised to the power of something. And so we're going to take down um, you know that that power or and yeah and then we subtract the power by one um, I guess it makes more sense if we look on this this right side so this is really p to the minus one you know we take down the power multiply it by our term and then we reduce that by one so it'd be p to the negative one and we take that negative one multiply it by what we have here and then we take that negative one and subtract one from it. So then it becomes this. And we apply the same process to this once more. So we're gonna take this top turn, bring it down um, to here. So we're multiplying it. And then we're also going to, um, what is it? Because this P term is negative, that's why we have this negative sign out here. When we bring it down again, um, we're also going to add a negative, which is going to cancel out this one. And so this right side becomes this right side right here. And just kind of putting it all together. So first off, we're going to, we're going to assert that the expectation of X times X minus one is equal to this. And to sort of convince yourself, um, why this is the case. Think about what the expectation of x alone would look like, and then think about what the expectation of x minus one alone would look like. And then if you were to just like multiply these together, you know, see how that would look like this top expression. Okay, and from there, we're just going to sub in um, p of x is equal to i, which we um, just established is um, one minus p to the i minus one times p, I believe. And we also, um, it notes here that if i is equal to one, then our term is just equal to zero. So we can skip over that and just 
set our, our i value to 2. And then we're just going to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation. So this p is going to come out. Um, we're also going to so we're going to take out another, we're going to take out a one minus P and put it out here. So that's going to force us to raise this one minus P term to, you know, a minus one, right? Because if we raise this to a minus one, then it's kind of like we have one minus P on the bottom. And that allows us to put one minus P outside on top so that they like cancel each other out. Hopefully that makes sense. And then from there, um, we see that this takes the form of what we had here. And that's why we did what we did. And simplifying, we get this 2 times 1 minus p over p squared. And that looks like this, which allows us to easily just sub in this for this term, allowing us to calculate the variance. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the memoryless property of uh, geometric distribution. And it's pretty straightforward. Basically, simple overarching idea. If we flip a coin, let's say five times, you know, what is the probability that we get heads on the sixth time? Well, it's still one over two if it's a fair coin because the previous trials have no influence on you know, the current trials. And that's pretty much, we're gonna say this in general terms. So what's, what's the chance that our first head is greater than n? Um, in this case, um, yeah. So in this case, this is kind of just the regular idea of geometric distribution so it's going to be the probability that all of our all of the n coins landed on tails so that our first head is greater than n but now we're going to say that we toss a coin m times and we want to know what the probability that we need n more tosses to get heads is so if we kind of look at Bayes rule um, you know we can remember that it takes this form and what we're saying is that given that we've tossed the coin m times, um, greater than m times, um, what is the probability that our random variable will take on some value um, greater than n plus m? So first off, we're going to take the union of these two events. Um, if the random variable x is greater than n plus m and it's greater than m, then naturally it's just greater than n plus m. And then, you know, we just kind of put this probability on the bottom. And subbing in the um, this kind of expression right here, we get this value, which just cancels out to one minus p to the n, which is really just stating, you know, what is the probability that a random variable takes on a value greater than n? So what this is saying is that the previous trials do not affect future trials. Okay, and now we're going to look at something called the coupon collectors problem. And um, the idea is that we want to collect all N baseball cards. And we're going to do so by buying a box of cereal which contains one card, where any card in our set of N cards has a one nth, one -nth chance of being in that box. So how many boxes will you have to buy to collect all N cards? Okay, and so we're going to have some, we're going to let that be our random variable x, and we're going to represent it as, um, or represent the expectation of x as a sum of a bunch of indicator variables, where capital I sub lowercase i is going to be the number of boxes we need to buy um, to try to get the ith card. You know, so if we want to get the first card, you know, how many boxes will we need if we want to get the second? card, how many boxes will we need? Well, so first off, you know, if we have zero cards and this I sub one is asking, you know, how many boxes will we need before we get 
our first card well clearly we just have to pull um, by one box because we can pull any card right so the second time um, it's now going to be equal to n minus 1 over n and the reason for that is if you just think about it we had n total cards that we could choose from we picked one box now we have one less card so now when we're picking our second box we have n minus 1 possibilities but all n cards have a 1 over n chance of being in that box so before when we could get all n cards each with n possibilities or n chance you know we could just pick any one of those but now we only have n minus 1 cards and so we we need those n minus 1 cards we can't have that one additional card and so you know now our chance is reduced slightly so i feel like i don't know i feel like the way i said it was not very I, this this is pretty intuitive i don't I feel like I'm making it a bit more convoluted than I have to, but I mean, it, I would suggest just like thinking about the example and thinking about how the probability changes as you pull. Um, but essentially, yeah, the probability gets reduced. Um, if we take the the expectation of this, um, the expectation of you know this probability is just one over p, as we established somewhere um, or sorry so this is for this is for a coin flipped I believe something anyways I might be confusing some things or sorry no yeah so the the expectation for a geometric distribution is 1 over P and so that's why that's why this takes this form. And yeah, we basically just kind of extend this out to, you know, however many cards we need. And it takes on this sum, and then this sum, you know, condenses down to this summation, which follows closely this expression right here. Um, okay. So we're going to move on to the Poisson distribution. And in general, what it's used for is for modeling the occurrences of sparse events. That's kind of what they say. Um, the examples didn't really solidify it for me, but that's, um, you know, I guess it's different for every person, but anyways, let's just get into it. So a random variable x for which the probability of x is equal to i is going to take on this expression. And it's going to have Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. And yeah, we abbreviate it as this, and then just to check to see that this, um, the probability of all i's sum up to one, um, we're just gonna kind of do that. and. This second to last step where we convert this expression into um, E of lambda is useful for when we're proving some of the later steps. And I'm going to kind of go through this somewhat quickly because I have discussion coming up soon. But so um, yeah, it's used to model rare events. The example they say is that, let's say we're writing an article and we make an average of one typo per page. So that means our lambda is going to be equal to one. So what is the probability that we make five typos on one page? So that's the prob so the probability that a random variable takes on five. So we can sub in um, five for i and one for lambda, and we'll get that we make, um, a, there's a one over 326 chance that we make five typos on one page. And then given that we write 200 pages, what is the probability that there are at least one page with five typos. So what we're saying is there exists a page with exactly five typos, which is the kind of the opposite of saying that every page does not have five typos. Okay, and we just need to sum or take the product of all of those probabilities. And this is also kind of the opposite of saying 
that a page K has exactly five typos. Okay, and then from here, we can just use what we had calculated above to put this into algebraic terms and then simplify. So this is just a visualization of the distribution of a Poisson random variable. Um, as we can see, it's kind of like left justified as the, when the lambda is smaller, but as the lambda increases, it becomes more like a bell curve. Okay, so let's talk about the mean and variance of a Poisson random variable. And it's pretty nice. Um, you know, the random variable has Poisson um, with parameter lambda. Then its expectation is lambda, and its variance is also lambda. So let's just take a look at the proof of the expectation. So again, this follows from the definition of expectation. This is the probability mass function for a Poisson distribution. You know, this is literally just like this up here. And then what do we do? Um, we're going to take out this e to the negative lambda. And then if you notice, this lambda to the i, we're also going to take that out. So we're going to take out one lambda. And that's going to force us to say lambda to the i minus 1. And that allows us to take a lambda out there. And then also, um, if we think about what you know a factorial is, it's i. Um, times i minus 1 times i minus 2 all the way until we hit 1. So if we have i in the numerator and then i factorial in the de denominator, then the i and the i terms are going to cancel out and we're going to get an i minus 1 factorial. So that's kind of what we have here. And um, using this, which is the um, Lagrange, or no, sorry, Taylor series expansion, um, we're going to sub in i minus 1 for j, and then this is just going to become e to the lambda. Okay, so clearly this becomes lambda, and then the variance follows a similar structure. So um, again, we're going to use that this funky term, um, which is going to allow us to calculate this form of the variance easier. So first off, um, you know, if we recall, it takes on this form. And then, um, let's see. Yeah, i equals 0 and i equals 1 um, become 0, so we can just omit those. This, we're just subbing in the mass function, probability mass function. And then in this case, we're going to kind of do the same thing we did above. This time, we're going to take two lambdas out. Um, and because we have i and i minus 1 up here, that's going to make the i factorial cancel out the two highest terms. And we need i minus 2 down here and i minus 2 up in the exponent in order for this expression to take this form, which allows us to use the Taylor series to get e to the lambda. And so this simplifies to this expression, which allows us to get lambda squared. And then just kind of plugging lambda squared in for this value, um, we just get this expression right here, which evaluates to lambda. So long story short, the expectation of a Poisson random variable is lambda, and the variance is also lambda. Okay, um, the sum of independent Poisson random variables is simply equal to um, summing their, what is it, either probability not really sure what to call this term, um, but let's just take a look at it really quick. Um, we're going to say that there's some k that is going to be some value that x plus y can take on. So we're going to say that you know x is equal to some j, and then um, y is equal to what's left over, right? Because x plus y has to get us to k. Because these are independent random variables, we can take the probability that x is equal to j and multiply that by the probability that y is equal to k minus j. From there, we can sub in the probability mass functions for the Poisson distribution and just put in the proper terms. And down here, all we do is take out this e to the negative lambda and this e to the negative mu. And we're also going to take out, we're just going to kind of 
we're going to take out something that's not explicitly here. So we're going to divide by 1 over k factorial, which means we're going to have to put a k factorial up on top. And what we're left with is these two terms, lambda to the j and mu to the k minus j, these get put out here. And then j factorial and k minus j factorial are left on the bottom. And putting it in this form just allows us to use the binomial theorem to get something that looks like this, which if we compare it to the original Poisson distribution mass function, or probability mass function, then we get, you know, this. So see how this is like the same as this. Okay, and then by induction, if we have a bunch of random var variables, um, like Poisson random variables that are independent, we can simply sum their, um, their probabilities. And then very quickly, because I'm going to be late, um, let's see, the Poisson is a limit of the binomial uh, what is it called? Distribution. So basically, if we put the binomial distribution into this form, um, then we can kind of, we see that as n approaches infinity, then our probability mass function is going to start to look like the Poisson distribution. So um, let's see, briefly. So first off, we assert that we're dealing with a um, binomial distribution and so normally it's n and p and so you know this is p right so this is the original form that it takes and just subbing in values um, we're going to expand out this choose this p is going to become lambda over n similarly this p is also going to become lambda over n next we're going to um, collect the factors in such so this is going to expand out so there's this n here, and then there's this minus i here. And let's see, what else goes on? We have this lambda to the i over here, this lambda to, or this one over n to the i over here, and then this is kind of maintained. And then we just kind of look at each things inside of each parenthesis and try to see what they simplify to. So as n approaches infinity, you'll notice that we have an n factorial on top, and then we have an n minus i factorial on the bottom. So if you think about n factorial, um, n minus i factorial is going to be like all of these smaller terms that you know multiply up to n factorial. So basically, that's kind of what this is saying. We have all these terms up here, and then at the end we have n minus one factorial. And then we have n minus one factorial up here, so we can just cancel those out. But notice that we have n or we have i terms on top, and we have an n to the i on bottom. So we can essentially divide each term by n because there are i terms in total. And multiplying this all out, you know, as n approaches to infinity, we can think, you know, this, this, um, as n goes to infinity, these basically go to one. So it's one times one times one goes to one. Um, and then I guess just from calculus, we know that this is the case. And then since i is fixed as n goes to infinity this is just going to um, shrink down to zero and then we're going to get one minus zero it's going to give us one so we're going to sub in each of these values this one this e to the negative lambda and then this one into their respective um, expressions and then we're going to sub it back in to the um, function that we have up here. So basically, we're going to see that it just takes on the regular um, Poisson distribution probability mass function. Okay, and that kind of completes that proof and completes the um, 19th note in CS70. So this has been geometric and Poisson distributions.